on the topic about sex and intimacy written by Muslim scholars, such as Imam al Shuti, who's um, an Egyptian scholar from the 16th century, originally of Persian descent. And he wrote like over 23 books on the topic of erotology or in Arabic, uh, meaning the science of sex or the art of sex. And there were other scholars such as Ibn Hazm as well, which we may touch on a bit later, who wrote books on, on love and intimacy. And basically what those books were about was teaching people the importance of se sexually satisfying their spouse, as well as how they can deal with a cup, um, some sexual issues or sexual problems that they may be facing. So for me, it was first like, okay, quite shocking that why was there so many scholars reading about writing about such topics and then also I wanted to trace and understand how did we get to the place where we are nowadays where even talking about this topic is seen as um, very taboo now obviously for those obviously listening who are not aware there's a spiritual well, there's a Sufi practice called um Nadur ila al where it's basically contemplating or looking at a beardless boy now in and this again this is not this is not Islamic, but it was a Muslim practice among some Muslims where there were some Muslims who were some Muslim men who were attracted to young beardless boys. So much so that some of them even said that looking when you look at a boy with like with lust, it's like you've seen Allah. All of these like really despicable wow. that even that Ibn Tamir made fatwa saying this is obviously not from the religion. Now, but again, if you understand that this was like a it, yeah, it was a perversion. This was like a, a fitna in the Muslim community. And there were scholars like Al-Ghazali and others who were giving fatwa saying, okay, because you've got this inclination towards young boys, if there's a young boy that's in near your presence, maybe don't sit near him because he, he's a fitna. That yes, we know that you are newly married, you're eager to see your wife, but you need to take her needs into consideration. So A, so she can be prepared for you. So you give her time so she's prepared, prepared for you. But even when during the lovemaking act that you need to be intimate and affectionate, but in a loving way, that is not just brute force, that kind of like a lot of men are obsessed by. But this is not something that's spoken about even with, amongst Muslims nowadays. It's like we shy away from it. That as if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi only married for political reasons. And there's no such thing as like um, having desire and fulfilling your desire in a legitimate way and enjoying that. It's kind of, again, it's seen as this is something that this is shameful because again we i think many of us um i'm speaking collectively have adopted a victorian christian understanding about sexual relations and marriage that you only get married primarily for procreational purposes and sexual intimacy is just something that you need to do as like as a, as a need not something that's a mutually pleasurable act for both the man and the woman so a lot of the scholars like imam al suti al-jahid and others they didn't have this concept even so much so that Ajahid him was speaking about our attitudes and he's speaking in the ninth century in Iraq and he's speaking he was speaking about how attitudes has changed even to even about divorced women so he was saying that why is it now like the divorced women obviously divorced Muslim women a lot of even the scholars of his time was were discouraging men from marrying them oh, when really? during the time of, yeah very, this, sounds very, quite, this sounds quite familiar with current trends anyway but in terms yeah, of and he was speaking in the ninth century he was speaking in the ninth century yeah. he said that why is it you discourage you know and you say that if a woman's been married before like she's like no good whereas this wasn't this wasn't the case of the during the time of the prophet and the companions clearly, clearly. assalamu alaikum welcome uh brother habib uh it's actually been a long time in which i've been reading your books and have been myself enlightened right Pun intended there, by your very thorough research in historic uh, Islamic historical um, analysis on various different topics, actually. And I've come to realize that you don't only discuss historic historical analysis from one perspective, but various other perspectives. Um, I've recently actually purchased your book, A Taste of Honey, right? you can see it there, which is a very unique, I would say, and courageous attempt, in fact, um, at enriching the Muslims and the non-Muslims, everyone really, on a very, very, uh, I would say even almost, uh, not controversial, but very sensitive topic. That's probably a better way to put it. Um, so we've, we've invited you today here to discuss the book and also your work um, in, history, in history, but also in um, erotology in Islam. 
So if you can please introduce yourself to the audience, inshallah, um, and we can commence from there. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. Um, thank you very much, Brother Ibrahim, for inviting me. Um, I'm looking forward to having this conversation. Um, yeah, just by way of introduction, my name is Habib Akande. I am a British-born Nigerian writer, sex educator, and historian and erotologist. Um, I graduated from Al-Azhar High School, and then I spent a year and a half in the university studying Islamic law, um, where I'm now back in, obviously, in the UK, working as a chartered accountant. And I also write books on the side. MashaAllah, just a few things. <laughs> just a few things. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, it's really good to have you here because, again, as I said, um, your work is very comprehensive, it's very diverse, you look at different things, and it's very rich in content as well. So I wanted to discuss with you um, in a lot more detail your work on the topic of Islamic erotology and sexuality. Uh, now, you said you're a, you're a sex educator, or a, is that the right term to use? That is correct. That's the right term. Right. Uh, how did you begin this journey, first of all, within Islamic history, generally speaking? How did you write your first book? But also, what led you towards this specific topic? Yeah, very good question. So when I was studying in Egypt, in Al-Azhar, so actually before I actually enrolled in Al-Azhar, so after I graduated um, from my degree in business studies and film studies in the UK, I then went to travel um, to Egypt in 2006 to further my Islamic knowledge, I wanted to study Arabic and and, and Islamic law, mainly because I wanted access to the Quran. And whilst I was there, um, I came across a number of books um, in like local bookstores on the topic about sex and intimacy written by Muslim scholars, such as Imam al Shuti, who's um, an Egyptian scholar from the 16th century, originally of Persian descent. And he wrote like over 23 books on the topic of erotology or in Arabic, uh, meaning the science of sex or the art of sex. And there were other scholars such as Ibn Hazm as well, which we may touch on a bit later, who wrote books on, on love and intimacy. And basically what those books were about was teaching people the importance of se sexually satisfying their spouse, as well as how they can deal with a cup, um, some sexual issues or sexual problems that they may be facing. Now, for me, this was something that I was blown away by because obviously I, I'm a Muslim, I was born in a Muslim household and I studied a little bit about Islam whilst I was in the UK, but I'd never come across Muslim scholars, well-renowned, prominent scholars writing about such topics because as you mentioned um, in, the, in the beginning, Brother Ibrahim, this is like a sensitive topic, so much so that in, amongst many Muslims nowadays, that to even speak about even the words or say the word sex is like a boy, it's like shame voice, or even some people will say it's haram. So for me, it was first like, okay, quite shocking that why was there so many scholars reading about writing about such topics? And then also I wanted to trace and understand how did we get to the place where we are nowadays, where even talking about this topic is seen as um, very taboo. Um, and that's why I wanted to obviously do my, some of my research to understand, okay, how did we get to where we was where in a lot of the Muslim societies, whether it's in Ottoman era, whether it's in Andalusia and Islamic Spain, whether it's um, um, in the Abbasid period from like the ninth century, there were a number of Muslim scholars writing freely about such topics, whereas nowadays, like I said, it's, there's a, it's a lot of stigma attached towards the subject. So for me, I thought it would be a um, really interesting endeavor um, to undertake this, um, you could say, passion project, um, to write a book to speak about the great contribution that Islamic scholars or Muslim scholars have made, um, the contribution that they've, they've made, and hopefully to revive this tradition of erotology and help solve some of the sexual crises that we're going through in this day and age where a lot of people are suffering in silence, both men and women alike. And I think a lot of people are, for different reasons, are uncomfortable to approach this topic when we know that when it comes to religious matters, there's no haya when it comes to the deen, there's no shyness. And if the Prophet wasallam was the most pious and the best of people was able to speak about such topics and and both male and female companions were both asking about such topics, who are we to feel that we are more pious or more righteous that we can't even speak about such such topics? And the reality is if we're not as Muslims speaking about this topic and addressing some of the concerns 
that people have, both male and female, then people will get this information from un-Islamic sources like pornography and what and what have you. So for me, I thought it would be, um, I knew it would be um, a topic that a lot of people will be um, concerned by. So that's why rather than putting myself out there, I wanted to document the research and the findings that I've come across and then put it out in the form of a book and then hopefully it will generate some interest. And then if people want to further their own study or their own research, then, then they can do. So that's in a nutshell how I embarked or came across uh, this topic. Well, it's definitely a very courageous endeavor, I would say that, because I'm familiar with your work. You've actually done a lot in terms of the Muslim heritage of um, resilience in Bahia region, this kind of thing. You've documented that as well. As I said before, uh, the Illuminates in the Darkness series as well. So these are typically uh, topics that are very safe or perhaps acceptable right, to, to indulge in. Whereas with this topic here, it's very difficult. Um, I remember reading one of your posts actually where you said uh, only, it's quite funny because you, you mentioned you invited people to a certain discussion and then you said mature adults only, which made me quite laugh a bit because an adult should be mature but not every adult is mature. <laughs> so on these sorts of topics it's very difficult to kind of gauge how far you can go with certain audiences because Yes, sorry to interject. Um, I would say with my first book, um, it wasn't actually, well, I didn't think it was as safe as maybe it may be now be considered to be safe. So when my first book, Illuminating the Darkness, was published in 2012, a lot of Muslim organisations, Muslim um, um, Islamic um, ISOCs, they didn't want to um, go near it. because oh, they really? Thought, yes, yeah. Because remember, this was before Black Lives Matter. Uh, this yes. was before... Okay it was comfortable for people to speak about the contributions that black people and Africans have made in history. Prior to that, the, um, I had a number of detractors. I had more pushback with the first book than A Taste of Honey, wow. to be fair. That is really I think strange. A Taste of Honey, yeah, a lot of, I think a lot of people maybe um, hadn't read or A Taste of Honey or I, I even went to one bookstore and the person, I just asked, have you got this book, A Taste of Honey? He, obviously he didn't know that I was the author. And he was showing me, oh yeah, it's this book. Um, I said, oh, what is it about? And he said, it's, it's, it's a cooking book. <laughs> so obviously, and this was obviously clearly... Uh, so, so, oh, my goodness. So, so, is... Right. So, but with Illuminating the Darkness, funny enough, like I said, there was more pushback I received that. And again, this was... And now, I'm, and I'm glad everything happens, obviously, in the last time, but I'm glad I wrote it when I did. And the reason, obviously, why, one of the main reasons why... I wrote it when I did was because of the um, the discrimination or anti-blackness that I witnessed whilst I was studying in Egypt. And I was surprised that I'm in Egypt, I'm in an African country, I'm with surrounded by people of different complexions, some obviously as dark as mine, or even darker. But there was this disdain that a number of the Egyptians had towards black people, where they'll be, you know, they may ask, you know, what time is it? Come Sa'a. So you look at your watch and then they start laughing because you're reminded of your blackness or you have kids just shouting, ya chocolata, ya chocolata. And people thought this was, you know, funny. Now for me, again, obviously I know that in Islam, racism does not exist in terms of what the religion says, but in terms of some Muslims and how they understand the religion or how they practice it is something totally different. So I wanted to understand how did we get to the point where we are now? You know, and then that's why when I came across, similar to when I came across books about erotology, I came across Ibn al Jawzi's wonderful work, Tanwira al Ghabashi Fadli Sudan al Habash. And then he was writing in his time, in I think the 12th or 13th century in Baghdad, about the virtues of black people and Abyssinians. And the reason why he wrote his book was because a number of the Abyssinians that he's in um, during his period came up to him and they felt that Allah had disgraced them or they were somewhat inferior because of their darkness of their skin. So he wanted to kind of address this idea that black blackness is inferior and to speak about the contributions that black people have made in history and in Islamic history. So again, when I wrote, and then obviously there was other scholars like Imam al and Jahid who also wrote similar books about the virtues of, of black people. Now there's a reason why they wrote these books was because mm -hmm. of of a clear anti-black sentiment in the Muslim community in, in the periods that they were living in. And it still exists, unfortunately, even in some of our classic Islamic texts. Now, like I said, when I was trying to publish that book, or when it eventually did get published, a number of organisations wasn't um, as forthcoming as 
Alhamdulillah, now many of them. Yeah, so it's, it's very different. And that's why now, Alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm glad to see where there's so many, um, there's been so many books, at least maybe six I can name of as well, um, in English, writing about the topic and many organisations are then now embracing it and they want to hear um, hear about you know, the contributions that black people have made, which, which is great because um, it is an issue. But um, the first book was definitely more of a challenge, whereas A Taste of Honey, I just think people just ignored it or they just didn't know what it was about. And it, when I think about it, maybe the subtitle as well, it, it wasn't quite clear because sexuality has got two meanings. The meaning sexuality means the capacity to have sexual relations or, sex, or have sexual feelings. But unfortunately, when people think about sexuality nowadays, they equate it with homosexuality. So okay. some people even thought that it was about homosexuality or something like that, which of course it's not, or promoting anything like that. And then erotology, I mean, you're the first person that's actually just said it off the roll of your tongue very easily, but a lot of people have difficulty pronouncing it. What does it mean? What does it refer to? So this, the subtitle is quite ambiguous. So... Um, Maybe that's why it didn't get as much of a pushback because um, people didn't really know what the book was about. Whereas Illuminating the Darkness, I just think people, yeah, there was a lot of um, resistance to to that book when it first came out compared to A Taste of Honey. This is really interesting stuff, actually, inside, because you're right, you know, a couple of years ago, maybe a decade ago, certain topics within the uh, confines of Muslim, at least certain practicing Muslim circles, were no goals. Right, focusing a bit too much on the complexion of maybe a certain Sahab or maybe a certain prophet was almost considered sacrilegious. This is black nationalism, this is Afrocentricism, this is outside of the fold of Islam. It doesn't matter anyway, we're all the same, right? Which in effect is denying a very inherent part of who we are and what Allah made us to be, that we should recognize one another. So uh, I, would, I wouldn't I would be too surprised, having heard what you said now, if that was the situation at the time where people felt it was perhaps a bit too um, aggressive, a topic to mount. But Alhamdulillah, we've reached a point now where this is actually, um, it's been given its due, its rights. Um, and I have read actually uh, Al Jahid, Al Fakhr al Sudan, Al Bidan, uh, and I find it very, 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 it's provocative for a reason for a reason, because at the time there was the whole Shorbiya movement, the Persians were taking over, the Arabs were also, and he kind of almost, he contributed a bit, you know, towards uplifting certain people who were not considered worthy of any sentiments whatsoever. So books such as the the, uh, Illuminating the Darkness, I believe, is a gem. You know, I keep it at one of the highest, uh, in one of the highest uh, shelves in my books, in my bookshelves at home, because it's a book that I want my children to inherit. I want my children to inherit that book and to read that book. It's that powerful. I commend you for that, but I also commend you for this book because it's another book that I believe is pioneering. You know, as you mentioned, maybe it could be a bit, you know, um, I don't want to use the word, um, uh, I don't want to use the word, um, I'm, I'm lost for words here. Uh, it's not a, a controversial book. But it's not a book that's easy to convey into others either, simply because, as you said, some people may not even know how to pronounce the word, let alone get into it. What I have found is very convenient and very useful is that the preceding authors were scholars that everybody can recognize, right? So by simply saying as suyoti Ibn Hazm for some people, and so on and so forth, wrote books on this topic, it automatically gives it some sort of credibility whereby there's no pushback, because if they wrote about this topic, then who are we to say it's not something that Islam should be concerned with? Did mm. you find much inspiration from the fact that these great scholars have actually written about this, as opposed to if it was a situation where you'd have to write it for your own self and kind of almost pioneer a certain genre within Islamic uh, literature? No, I, I get great. Um, Imam al Sut is one of, is one of my favorite scholars. Oh, and. Again, he was a scholar. He wrote about like the virtues of black people. So he wrote actually three books on that on that particular topic, similar to Ajahid. And obviously he wrote about erotology over, over 20 books. Now, I loved actually what you said when you spoke about Ajahid and his book. And, and that's why also it's important as Muslims, especially students of history, to understand the context and when things were written. Because Absolutely. if you were to even take 
even the title of Ajahid is his book. It's like oh, calling for black supremacy. And again, exactly. people do not understand the context in which he was writing a book and what was going on. And similarly, if you're reading, um, even like, for example, Imam al-Ghazali as well, where I remember I was reading, I'm not sure if it was in, in Ihya, or one of his books, he was speaking about, like, uh, he was giving a fatwa saying that you shouldn't look at um, a beardless boy. Yes. And I was reading, I was thinking, what is this yeah. about? Yes. Without understanding the context. Now, obviously, for those obviously listening who are not aware, there's a spiritual, well, there's a Sufi practice called... Um, where it's basically contemplating or looking at a beardless boy. Now, in and this again, this is not this is not Islamic, but it was a Muslim practice among some Muslims, where there were some Muslims who were some Muslim men who were attracted to young beardless boys, so much so that some of them even said that looking when you look at a boy with like with lust, it's like you've seen Allah. All of these like really despicable wow. that, that even even Tamil made fatwa saying this is obviously not from the religion now but again if you understand that this was like a it, yeah, it was a perversion this was like a, a fitna in the muslim community and there were scholars like al ghazali and others who were given fatwa saying okay because you've got this inclination towards young boys if there's a young boy that's in near your presence maybe don't sit near him because he, he's a fitna but if you're reading this like when i first came across this and i'm reading this in one of the books when i was studying it's like and obviously, I'm, I've got like a struggle bit, so I don't you've got much space in here. So is it haram for me to sit? You know, like, you understand the context. And that's why, again, as Muslims, it's important, especially when we're reading this historic text, A, we need to understand the context in which certain things were written. And B, it's important, and we have to understand the difference between Islam and Muslim practices or Islamic history. Because oftentimes, people use the terms interchangeably, as if, everything that happened in islamic history or, or, or if something was tolerated in islamic history therefore it's acceptable in islam and that's also what i wanted to demonstrate with um with a taste of honey is that there were a number of things that were said or that were even done in terms of sexual practices things that were said about in terms of giving advice that you need to understand the context in which it was said in it doesn't necessarily mean it was islamic the book um is not a book given for tawa because i'm not a um a jurist i'm not in a position to give to give fatwas it's basically showing the different social commentaries of great muslim scholars that spoke about this particular topic and again it's if if they and these were people that were again great theologians great jurists people that knew the deen people that inshallah that were from the mutakun these were people that were pious right but they were addressing issues the same way like in our modern day society we've got issues with it's porn and um, porn addiction whether it's the LGBT and things like that. These are issues that need to be spoken about. And even when I reflect that, when I wrote that book in 2000, and it came out in 2015, but just say between 2012, 13, 14, when I was writing it, or towards the end when I was finishing writing it, because it took me over 10 years to write, I didn't mention like the different um, Huruf. I didn't even mention it because in, in detail, because it wasn't really such an issue whereas nowadays if i was going to write such a book i'll need to kind of actually explain that in islam there's two genders male female because this is stuff that like nowadays there's people that are actually confused by like how many genders are there is there a difference between sex and gender these are the type of questions that unfortunately muslims and certainly young people adults as well are being confused because they don't because of what's been going on and what's been pushed out there so again i just think that as as muslims we do need to be people that do not live in the past but draw inspiration from the past so it's not just a case of, oh this is what they done in the past and look how great our scholars were and they spoke about these issues they're issues that are affecting people nowadays that we need to talk about and i think you can and for me i like to draw inspiration from the past and with like i said with erotology tradition it's to renew not to revive but it's to renew something that we've already got, but to renew it and obviously something that's make it more applicable for um, modern day people kind of thing. So. And you're very right in mentioning that there was an issue in a classical sense with the beardless young boys. Okay. Yeah. It wasn't the only Imam al-Ghazali who, who gave fatawa against this. Actually, I believe it was Imam Malik or Imam Ahmed yeah. who actually went a level above and said that to uh, the allure of a beardless young boy, is greater than that of a woman 
in certain instances. And he said that the people should safeguard their children if they have young boys, because it's a great temptation for certain people in society. So these are realities. These are realities that compel those authors to have written these books and made this fatawa, which we cannot ignore in a world we live in today, as you mentioned mm -hmm. rightfully. We don't live in a world where these things are given. No, people don't even know what gender. The concept of gender is being changed every single day. So if we as Muslims are to purposefully uh, castrate ourselves intellectually by saying we don't discuss these topics, our mm -hmm. children and the generation to come will have nowhere to go. They'll have nowhere to go. They'll be left to the whims and desires of whatever society is giving them as a definition of gender relations, gender dynamics. Uh, so this may be at this stage, perhaps a bit advanced, but I believe just like in your first book, in years to come, it will be considered not only relevant, but essential to understanding who as Muslims we are when it comes to this issue here. Um, now, my first exposure to this sort of topic within a Muslim setting was when I read the book of uh, Ibn Hazm al-Andalusi, Tawq al-Hamama. And I came across this book when I was about 16 years old in a library. Right? I read that book in one day. <laughs> it's, the, it's the only book in my life I've read in one day. Right? <laughs> Simply because it wasn't graphic, but it was the fact that a scholar of his caliber was writing about this topic and in a very scholastic way. He yeah. categorized, for example, the uh, another like the stare the glaze glaring at somebody um, the different types of look you can give someone when you're in love with them infatuation levels of love right he also talks about homoerotic topics of men who fell in love with young boys and he mm. was candid and direct with it and i love that the fact that he could be candid and direct but also maintain islamic etiquette and morals while doing so so that book introduced me to this topic effectively many years ago um, but reading this book kind of gave me more in terms of the science of this um, discipline, the history behind it. I did not know that Imam Suyuti, who is, by the way, my favorite historian, wrote about this, mm. let alone 23 books. Mm. What do you think compelled them to actually make a science of this? And where was this science drawn from? Were there already, is there any kind of um, incentive or any kind of foundation upon which they can build upon? Or do you believe it was just something they created and then developed? Excellent question. Excellent question. I think um, I think Imam al Siyuti he answered it himself in one of his books where he mentioned that in the field of erotology, the hadith of Jabir is is the inspiration. Where and I'm just going to paraphrase where Jabir, who was um, obviously a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when he was coming back, when they were traveling back to Medina from um, after um, an expedition, he was hurrying, and then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked him why was he like in such a rush, and he mentioned that he was newly married and he was on his way to see his his wife, and then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked him a couple of questions, initially asking whether she, um, she was um, a virgin or um, mar been married before. Um, and then Jabir mentioned that she's um, she's been married before. But then he one of the things that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said is that take your like when you go in, he said al case al case, meaning be affectionate, and also it means like take your time in the intimate relations. And then he also said, do not go into like Medina, do not go in, into a house into your house until the night, until uh, basically after daybreak. So until, after not in not in the middle of the night, so she has time to groom herself, shave her pubic hairs, and be ready and prepared for you. Now, this is a very graphic, and, it's, and the hadith is in Bukhari. This And so it's an authentic hadith. Now, this is a very um, graphic hadith, but in a beautiful way, and it's speaking about not only the needs of the man, but more importantly, the needs of the woman. That, yes, we know that you are newly married, you're eager to see your wife, but you need to take her needs into consideration. So, A, so she can be prepared for you, so you give her time so she prepared, prepared for you. But even when during the lovemaking act that you need to be intimate and affectionate, but in a loving way, that is not just brute force, that kind of like a lot of men are obsessed by. And you've got hadiths like this and many others during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke about how a man should be with his wife. So for a lot of the scholars, again, they didn't have this reticence that many of us have nowadays to approach this topic. And it's quite interesting, even like Qadr Iyad, he will speak about one of the the things that the companions used to take be take, be so proud of 
that our prophet was had the most number of wives and could satisfy his wives. They took pride in this because even for in for the Arabs, in sense of manliness, was that you're able to satisfy a number of women. And obviously, the morality, in, of course, the reality. Yeah, morality, exactly in a halal way. So, but this is not something that's spoken about even with, amongst Muslims nowadays. It's like we shy away from it. That as if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam only married for political reasons. And there's no such thing as like um, having desire and fulfilling your desire in a legitimate way and enjoying that. It's kind of, again, it's seen as this is something that this is shameful. Because again, we I think many of us, um, I'm speaking collectively, have adopted a Victorian Christian understanding about sexual relations and marriage that you only get married primarily for procreational purposes. And sexual intimacy is just something that you need to do as like as a, as a need not something that's a mutually pleasurable act for both the man and the woman so a lot of the scholars like imam al suti al-jahid and others they didn't have this concept even so much so that al-jahid he was speaking about our attitudes and he's speaking in the ninth century in iraq and he's speaking he was speaking about how attitudes has changed even to even about divorced women so he was saying that why is it now like the divorced women obviously divorced Muslim women, a lot of even the scholars of his time was were discouraging men from marrying them. Oh, when really? during the time of, yeah. Very, this, sounds very, quite, this sounds quite familiar with current trends anyway. But in terms yeah, of and he was speaking in the ninth century. He was speaking in the ninth century. Yeah. He said that, why is it you discourage, you know, and you say that if a woman's been married before, that she's like, no good. Whereas this wasn't, this wasn't the case of the, during the time of the prophet and the companions. Clearly. clearly. So, it, and, and, and we have said, and again, I know for some Muslims, they wouldn't understand, it's very difficult, but I'm, you're comfortable with the topic, um, what, what I'm going to explain, is that we have to understand that for a lot of this, at, the, at their period, okay, if I would to say, um, how many lawful sexual partners can a man have in the Quran? Uh, you mean it's mandated or, yeah, four? No, how many is permitted to have? Oh, permitted to four. have uh, wives yeah. four, but in terms four. of if, if you can mention more than wives, like concubines and that, when it's unlimited, isn't it? Exactly. To be honest with you and Frank, without making any politically correct statements, it's unlimited. Right. But only four right. wedded wives, yes. Baraklafik. Now, the reality is, and even with a number of the scholars, they had multiple sexual partners, lawful. We don't, some had up to four wives, but like you said, in terms of concubines, you know, some of them had multiple. Now, their sexual experiences, and I go on, and I know for a lot of modern day Muslims, this might be like, oh my god, to even hear this. They had multiple sexual experiences with obviously with some of their concubines. And this is what Jahid was talking about. That what happened was a number of the men they were favoring their concubines as like sexual pleasures. Okay. But the wife is just, oh, the wife is just oh, she was just left hanging. hanging. Yeah, it's left hanging. And she's just especially if she's a free woman. And that's why even when they were writing some of their works, like uh, Jahid, he wrote a book specifically about the concubines that a lot of the men were just favoring the concubines now the reason why this is very difficult to speak about for modern muslims nowadays is because they haven't even got that frame they don't even um, some muslims don't even believe that concubinage is is permissible in islam it depends was, uh, brother have, have it, it depends because mm -hmm. i think in practice concubinage is still very prevalent it's alive and kicking right. oh, yeah. if yeah. you say i have 10 girlfriends nobody has a problem with that the moment yeah. you want to talk about a marital relation or something like that more official yeah. then it becomes a problem so i think in concept or in practice sorry in practice it's acceptable but perhaps as a but amongst, religious, amongst religious people it's not accepted it wouldn't be accepted nowadays the, I, the concept the thought that's what i'm saying the, the idea that it's very difficult so much, to accept i can i can yeah, agree with that it's very difficult yeah, to that, accept. That's, that, that's why even explaining um like you said, yes, I agree. There's de facto concubinage in terms of people having girlfriends, but not amongst like people that you would respect, like religious people and things like that, or scholars. But the idea that a scholar had a concubine, a lot of people would. I, that's why I don't even mention it in certain um, when I'm in certain conversations because again, I don't affect um, people's iman because people just again. But I've listened to, you know, I've listened to people of your videos and stuff like that and i know you've dealt with and spoke about slavery and things like that so it's 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 difficult to um broach this topic speaking to modern audiences because you need to understand the world that some of these scholars were living in again it doesn't mean that they were taking advantage of all of these women 
but it was similar to the post when you, I think you put up last week about, um, it was either Ibn Khaldun or Ibn Batuta. Ibn Batuta, yes. Ibn Batuta, for example. Yeah. Yeah. And I saw some of the comments, and again, it's just like, again, it is, yeah. it's, it's, it's soul shattering for many people yeah. because they perceive scholars and religious figures as being almost detached from human faculty, right? They shouldn't be thinking about sensuality or relationships. They should be thinking only 24-7 religious worship, which, by the way, in Islam, that is a part of religious worship if you have the right intention for it. Right? But what I tend to believe personally is that we can lie to ourselves as much as we like. Right? But at the end of the day, the human nature never changes. Right? Whether we call them concubines and mistresses, kings, and not just Muslims, this was a convention globally. It was a global convention, and in many cases, the women themselves and their families would actually favor for her to be a concubine to a powerful man because there was a social mobility there for her children, for herself, so on and so forth. So we're talking about a different paradigm altogether. We're not talking about someone around the corner today who's only got minimal means of survival, taking on three or four concubines. It would be ridiculous, clearly. Yeah. But in the classical sense, it wasn't a problem. Uh, I think it's just translating that to modern audiences can be a, a major challenge because some people, and I've seen the responses, it's almost very, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a conflict in terms of what they think Islam is and what they're seeing through the actions of men who are Muslims. Exactly. It's not always the same thing, but it's interesting. I don't know how you convey this message to people, large audiences. Well, well, yeah. that's, well that's, that's the funny thing. Although I mention it, but I don't go into too much detail, and I do even say that, because again, I think even you, you, you can't, I'm not going to lie on the Quran. I'm not going to say the Quran doesn't permit such and such when it does talk about certain things. But, I, but when, when it comes to concubinage, I, I say that obviously because it's not like practice nowadays, like legitimately, I'm only going to speak about like marriage is in the only lawful way for um, a man to obviously have, have sexual relations. Um, but then when I'm speaking about what a number of the scholars have spoken about, I just speak about like women in general. I'm not going to separate between concubinage and and, uh, and and a wife. But ultimately, what one of the things I'm emphasizing, which I think a lot of people appreciate, was that a lot of the scholars they had understanding about the importance of women's sexual satisfaction, because oftentimes we hear about the importance of women make, making themselves sexually available for their husbands, but you don't hear much about scholars writing about teaching men the importance of men pleasing their wives. And again, this isn't from them. This was inspired from the hadith of the Prophet yeah. and even, when, even when people think about Umar bin Khattab, they think about him, yes, being, you know, mashallah, very strong. Some people say very harsh with women, but he was also someone who was compassionate and was aware of women's needs. So much so that when he was, um, when he was a, um, the, the caliph, and he was doing his um, patrols that he used to do around Medina, and he overheard a woman who was speaking about, she was reciting some poetry, I'm not gonna try and yes. recite the poetry. But she was I've reciting that some poem, yeah. And she was basically saying that if um, if it wasn't for the fear of Allah and the fact that I would disgrace my husband, I'll go and commit zina, because she was yearning for intimacy. She's a woman, she's got feelings like anyone else. When Umar heard this, what did he do? He and by the say, way, just, just for contextualization, the husband was away. On the yeah, sorry. The husband, yeah, the yeah. husband was away on a, on a battlefield. Um, so obviously Umar heard this. Now, when he heard this, he first thing he did, he went to his daughter Hafsa and he asked her, he said, how long can a woman go without basically intimate relations? And then she basically said, either like she's with her hands, she said, even like four or five months. Then he legislated that Muslim men should not, obviously away on, um, on jihad, should not be away from their wives for more than four months. And then based on that ruling, that's why scholars then, like the, the jurists later on then said that the minimum that a man should stay with, um, should not be without his wife is at four months. But again, if you're just reading the books of fiqh and you're just saying, oh, Imam Malik says such and such, you wouldn't understand the reason behind it. Absolutely. And even the fact that this is a Muslim scholar, this is not even a Muslim scholar, so a, a ruler, some of that knows the deen, but it was conscious of the welfare of women. Another time a woman went up to him, approached him, and he was she was speaking um highly of her husband, that mm. he was very pious, he prays That's all the time, he does 
And then mashallah, Omar said, Nick Maharaja, like, great man. Yeah. He didn't understand and there was another companion that said, no, she's actually yeah, okay. confirming that, he, that he's not attending to her needs. Now, again, if this was mentioned nowadays, a lot of even, unfortunately, Muslim, you know, whether scholars, speakers, will feel horrified that a woman can say such a thing. And they'll even say that she is unchaste, or she hasn't got no higher. And again, so that's what I wanted to, for people to 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 look at. No, the the best of people after the prophets, so the sure. companions, they ask these type of intimate questions because they had the right. Both men had the right to sexual satisfaction, and women had the right to sexual satisfaction. And they also had some problems. They also had some issues. Whereas, I think as well when when we look at if you, when I hear a lot of like, like the stories when people talk about the Muslims of the past, if you notice. Um, we generally hear a lot of the great stories about people after the companions. That when you hear about the great, you know, Muslim figures and personalities after the companions, it's either the scholars, those um, the mujahids, or the the people that were worship great worshippers. Now, in a lot of these stories, it's just like wonderful. Like yeah. this person memorized the Quran at seven years old. They prayed. This, you know, it's a lot of great. It's just like aspirational things. When you hear the stories about the companions and the stories of people in the Quran, it's human stories, mm. people that were struggling, but they were the best of people. Mm. And for me, like even for myself, when I read their stories, it helps my iman as well, because these are people that were struggling with different human mm. human situations that we go through. And I just think that sometimes when we just speak about, um, that's not to say that we don't speak about you know our great scholars and things like that, but we don't see some of the, the trials, the human trials that they go through that kind of, that we can kind of relate to kind of thing. So for me, um, in terms of like how I'm trying to convey or exp explain a taste of honey is first, we we have to normalize these kind of discussions or these, because again, they were normalized during the time of the Prophet And there were scholars, because this idea that men weren't interested in satisfying the um, the needs of their wives, that's not true. There are some men that's like that, or there maybe there's a lot, but there was also a number of men inspired by the Prophet who were interested in teaching men the importance of satisfying the needs of their wife. So again, like for me, again, it's, it's, it's to try to, um, I want to highlight the contributions, the positive contributions that Muslim scholars have made from different parts of the world, and also to kind of hopefully inspire um, other Muslims so we can kind of delve into this topic obviously from a God conscious framework because even that I mentioned it in the like, introduction that hopefully this book can help um, be part of the contribution towards the revival and um, the renewal of erotology and also help inspire people to kind of speak about sexuality with a God conscious framework because like I mentioned previously since the book has been released so much has happened that there's definitely more kind of <coughs> issues that need to be kind of addressed no, you're perfectly right. I think if we look with an honest eye, because an honest eye, even in the Quran, uh, as, as uh, I think according to Mufassirun or those who study Quran, um, they have this term called Ishara. It's like a direction. It's not telling you explicitly something, but it's giving you like a, a hint towards something. Right? And there is an ayah wherein um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Yama is in on that day, the believers will be busy for sure him, they'll be busy yeah, in their activities. Yeah? Yeah. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, what would they be busy doing? Praying, mm -hmm. fasting? And he mentioned yeah. what it was they'll be busy doing. Yeah. And I think the modern audience may find even that a bit hard to 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 uh you want to explain what other people are doing? You didn't. Uh, no, they, you can, didn't. they can read the Quran for themselves. I don't want to say. No, it. Thing. no you, you please say it, and then we will talk about it. Because honestly, this is... genuine, I think this is it's in the Quran. That's one example. Before I move on to the next one, it's one example. Yeah. And I believe that is an example of what you are saying. It's available in the Deen. Right? It's done in a very beautiful way. It's not grotesque in the way it's being done today. It's not something that is um, reprehensible or uh, just vulgar. It's very, very beautifully packaged. And the same thing, even within the hadith, where you find companions saying, Ya Rasulullah, when we come to our wives, do we get a reward for that? I said, yes, sadaqah. Mm -hmm. It's a virtuous deed that you satisfy one another in this way. Or that he said to the men, how can any one of you pounce upon his wife like an animal does? Right? Mm -hmm. That everything has a messenger. said, what's the messenger? said, the messenger of love is, you know, foreplay. How does that begin? Mm -hmm. Kind words. So we have all of this in the deen available to us. But I think we have ourselves 
through a sense of superiority perhaps, kind of decided that this is not something that is worthy of any attention and that it doesn't belong within the framework of Islamic sciences. It's just something that is there, right? We don't necessarily I'm, have to go into it. Yeah, I'm troubled by that. The reason why I'm troubled by that is that, like you said, this is, if this, this is mentioned in the Quran, it's mentioned in the Hadith, it's mentioned in our great books. And this was something that even the companions asked about, will we have intimate relations in paradise? Yeah. And if we're thinking, oh, we're above this, well, we don't need this. It's like, who do we think we are? That's what that's that's my first thing. Is like, who do you think you are, or do you think you are more refined and more civilized than Sorry. the companion? You know that that's what I'm really troubled by. That the if you're uncomfortable, and I always tell people that like, my work is not for everyone. If you're uncomfortable with it, that's fine. And also, I'm not trying to give this impression that everyone was comfortable to speak about sex and sensuality even during the time of the prophet because there's different understands or different things on what people were comfortable with, and that's fine but to shut it down and to make say this is not part of the religion when it's clear like i've i've heard people say things like um there's no intimate relations in paradise um polygamy that doesn't is, that, that, that is really something what kind of paradise would that be and we know, I'm not, I'm, no, we know. I'm, 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 no honestly no, really okay, yeah i've heard um it's because people are uncomfortable with it. But this so part again, is very, it's a very clear Quranic ayat. I'm going to give you ayat here. Akhi, <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking well, about here? Okay, but even the way Allah beautifully describes the women of paradise, mm. people have said no, that refers to um I know, I've heard that. Exactly, yeah. That, you know, yeah. Things like that. And it's because they are uncomfortable. So if you're uncomfortable with something, okay. you're just going to search for something that suits your sensibilities okay that that makes sense That's what it means. so i'm not trying to go again because again i don't want to rock people's iman so that's why i don't like i won't speak so much about these type of things especially with it's men only i will speak about it because more men are more comfortable with it but um because of the the challenges that i'm faced i'm, I'm finding that a number of um unfortunately maybe some women are having is that they look at the religion that it's just for male's pleasure and this that, and the other, it's. I don't want to like make it like that. That's the case, so I don't even really touch on it. But I'm not going to deny it. You know, I'm not going to deny it. So I just think sometimes you, we need to have a bit more tact when we're talking about it. But at the same time, the same way, like for example, you didn't explain what the hadith. I mean, what the verse in the Quran yeah, is yeah. referring to. That I a lot of people like. Aren't it's, even not everyone, it's not for everyone. It's not for. I know. I hear. Yeah, no, I, I hear what you're saying, but then at the same time, this is where I look at it. If you read even when if if you read the Quran, if you read the Hadith, it is very explicit without being vulgar. Exactly. So it's like if you're reading it, you will know about sexual relations, you know about intimacy, because it's speaking about sexual ethics, sexual conduct, all of these things that you won't whereas nowadays when we talk about sex education, it's like it's just for children up until maybe like 13, 14 years of age. And then after that, we don't really need to talk about it. Well, it's when, everywhere, actually. It's everywhere, like Never, even, in terms, of, even in terms of even in even in terms of um so even like um, even as Muslims, it's not complete free for all. So even how a man, the Prophet was very clear in the sense of do not enter your do not go to your women in the anus. And he said it many times. And then he said in Allah La Yastahimin al Haq that Allah is not shy of the truth. So there are some things that need to be said clearly. Whereas if we were adopting an approach that, no, no, we can't talk about because this is, you know, this is not befitting to speak about in a mosque. Mm -hmm. It's not to be befitting to speak about in a platform where there may be children listening. Then I ask the question, when can you say it? And that's, that's I think, one of the problems as well, because a lot of the, a lot of the conversations, a lot of the commentary around in intimate relations and things like that, they are said in a platform where, it's open to everyone now again of course it's important for the the parents to police their children um and then obviously let them know what they can and can and can't listen to and then give them education in a more age-appropriate way uh, i don't know i think i'm a bit more of a stoic on this sort of issue i like to get straight to the facts and not to play around with semantics because we live in an age which is hyper sexualized yeah so if you're going to block halal and a wholesome avenue through which muslims can understand and be better informed about the duties it's a duty you know uh and nikah literally is intercourse that's what it means right 
it's a duty. So you cannot be so holy and so detached from reality that you ignore that altogether. Yeah. Where you live in a world where it's fully hypersexualized, and those who are conveying the message in movies, in songs, in video games, are not going to even be concerned about what's decent or not. They'll give it to you in the most grotesque and almost abrasive manner. Oh. So we don't live in a world which perhaps 50, 60 years ago, these were topics of impropriety. We don't talk about this in public. It's everywhere. It's yeah. literally everywhere. And if unless we're willing to step forward and say, you know what, Islam has a solution for this, as it has with everything else, this is how we approach the topic. It's a sacred act in Islamic, uh, Islamic uh, within our tradition. It's a sacred act, something to be yeah. preserved and cherished and cultivated and nurtured. If we cannot do that responsibly, well, then I'm sorry, there are others who will be teaching your children how this is done in various different ways. And there is little we can do to counter that unless we're willing to engage positively with it. So I don't agree that we should always kind of bow down to the the fake sentiments or outrage of certain people because there's a greater risk for the greater population of Muslims, especially the younger generation, who are being educated about this from female rappers or female whatever entertainers right we live in an age of only fans for example mm. you'd be surprised how many young people get involved with that right yeah so we need to have certain things that they can turn to and feel confident that this is something we can draw inspiration from we can learn from which will help us grow spiritually but also in other ways um but again this i believe is a mentality that's going to die out very soon because the situation we're right now, certainly without help because we've been pushed so far mm. to the left, whereby we don't even know whether it's politically correct to say same gender relationships are allowed or not. Right? We've been pushed that far to the point where Muslims are trying to justify, perhaps even circumvent uh, those sorts of topics or condemning it. What is left? You know, we can't be discussing issues of this is not allowed in Islam because it's men and women. When we have issues of men and men and women and women that our children are being taught daily in school and in university. 50 years ago, perhaps, but now I think it's actually it's intolerable to have that kind of mentality. We cannot allow for ourselves to be left behind when the world really is in a deluge. Right? It's fully, uh, it's a full assault when it comes mm -hmm. to this topic. Yeah? So I don't agree that we should always. And to be honest with you, Brother Habib, I believe it's almost like four sentiments. It's fake outrage, right? Because those who may be the most vocal against it may be the ones having the greatest problems in their own relationships right mm -hmm. they may need the help more than anyone else but because uh, it's be so vocal yeah I'll, I'll show you something obviously i'm not going to say any names but it's quite interesting because i've had um one particular um he was an imam and well respected in the community he obviously was familiar with my book the taste of honey he sent me a long like maybe about three paragraphs of, um, of of why this book is problematic and was circling some things and saying, you know, this shit, what is this, what is that? Um, and then he uh, contacted me about six months later and he told me he was having issues. He married the second wife, but he was having issues with this with, with his first wife um, in terms of like erectile dysfunction and things like that. And then he wanted my advice. And I asked him, I said, how come you're speaking to me now when you've got an issue, whereas previously you was, you know, criticizing me and saying, why am I putting this book out? And he said, you know, brother, I had to do that because people in my community was, they heard about your book. So I needed to kind of show that, you know, I wasn't, I understand what you're doing and it's good, but I, that's the reason why I had to say what I, I said, but now can you, is there any advice that you can give me? And I was just like, that's a problem. That's even, a, for me, that's even a bigger problem than, what you said i don't mind people criticizing me and stuff like that that's fine but the fact that because you now think that okay you need some help or some like you need some help now it's like okay i'm, I'm okay to speak to this person he can help me but you don't feel that that potential benefit beneficial knowledge is okay for everyone else because it might lead them astray that's where it's a problem because like i said there's a number of learned muslims who know about this topic but they don't want to talk about it the same way, like I said, there's a number of learned Muslims who know about the crisis, what's going on, but they don't want to talk about it. They want to put um, our heads in the sand, so to speak. But if it's something that's affecting them personally, then they might seek out to the to, to people to kind of like help them. And I just think, I, I, you know, I don't know how to rectify that because obviously you can't make someone 
do something that they're not comfortable with doing. But like I said, this is not a new topic. And if anything, that's why having these kind of discussions, especially on the internet where people can watch it and they can do their own research and things like that, then hopefully more people will be confident enough to kind of, or really in the Quran it says such and such, in the Hadith it says such and such, scholars like such and such wrote such and such book, and then they'll be more welcoming and open to kind of discuss such issues and look at these as viable solutions to kind of like what is prevailing in, in society today. I think one of the issues that a lot of Muslims do have is that there's not much um, um, that we've got with Islam. Because what I find quite uncomfortable is that if I were to talk about some topics, speak about some of these topics that the Prophet Sallallahu said such and such, this scholar said such and such, they don't want to hear it. If I mention someone that maybe that they respect, like Malcolm X or even a non-Muslim people, oh, really? And they may, maybe will share it and things like that. That's why it's quite interesting. With A Taste of Honey, a lot of the Muslims haven't really welcomed to it until I wrote um, another book that was written generally from an African perspective. Well, that, wasn't okay, from, right. that wasn't from a, a Muslim perspective. Then Muslims were promoting that book and then they were like, oh, you also wrote a book, A Taste of Honey. That's about, it's like, and I think some people having sex, having Islam and sex, like in the title, or even orgasm and Islam, it just puts people off. And that's also what I've realized over the last like five to 10 years is that, and again, it's like, you can have a message or you can have some information, but it's how you are giving that information. And obviously you want that information to be um, received. You want the person to be receptive to what you're saying. And that's what I've learned through experience that as much as, you can be very factual and clear to the point, but some people, that would be too much for them. Like, unfortunately, some people, they will hear some information or receive it if you don't mention, I'm talking about sexual stuff or intimacy matters, that you don't mention that it says this in the Quran or the Prophet Sallallahu says such and such. Because for them, that's no, that, that's, that, that's, it makes them uncomfortable. Which is quite strange because, you know, uh, this reflects more of a Protestant approach to relations. You know, certain pre-Islamic, even Judaic, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina, when the companions complained about the different positions available, women were saying no in Medina because of the Jewish influence on those women. He, you know, uh, that we know the translation of that ayah. And that kind of incensed some of the Jewish, Jewish inhabitants of Medina that everything we say, he says the opposite, right? Mm even when it comes to relations between a man and wife, right? Yeah. That was a sign of Islam being an alternative for people. Right? Yeah. Something was constricted for people. It was a real problem because companions complained about this issue with their wives to the Prophet Sallallahu and Allah revealed an ayah in the longest surah in the Quran concerning this. So it's not a trivial matter. <laughs> but the fact that we are now today, I think we follow a certain Pauline Christian attitude towards this because Paul and he wrote his epistles to the uh, to the Romans he said that um, if you must then have one wife but otherwise abstain altogether you know it's not it's, it's not something that is clean or good for man in a way if you must just have one wife stay with her but it's better to abstain altogether but we know in Islam abstinence is not part of our deen mm -hmm. when the Prophet said to his companion have you married he said no I said to him well a nikah in sunnati uh, it's part of my sunnah. If you don't want to be part of this, then you can go and live with the monks in the monastery, literally. Right? Mm -hmm. So we've gone back to this mode of thinking that we want to be with the monks when we should be actually fulfilling our natural urge and desire within the halal bounds that Islam has given us. Mm -hmm. And if we do that in the right way, it's actually, a, it's not just a pleasurable um, uh, endeavor in the sight of Allah, but actually a virtuous one. Mm -hmm. It's a virtuous mm -hmm. endeavor. Because if we do it the wrong way, there's punishment. If we feel it the right way, then inshallah, ta'ala, it's, it's a sign of virtue for us. So uh, it's been a long discussion. It's already gone past an hour. And I know you're a very busy man. Yeah, you're a very busy man. But um, I would like to thank you once more for taking time to share with us um, your knowledge, your insights. And tell us a bit more about perhaps what's available. Do you have any programs, uh, anything else associated with this topic here? Yeah, uh, I'm actually, yeah, so A Taste of Honey, that's available on Amazon and my website, rabbaah.com. And I'm also going to be doing a webinar um, in a couple of weeks, end of July, inshallah, 
um, called The Art of Loving, which is going to be based on a taste of honey and Islamic erotology. So speaking about, because a lot of people do not like reading, um, so I'm going to be touching on, hopefully bringing the jewels and the gems. Um, and yeah, so if people are interested, you can check that out on my Instagram page. And I've got a link where you can find out about that webinar. Um, hopefully that's going to take place on the 23rd of July, I believe. Um, so yeah. And just Jazakallah Khairan again, brother, for Prophet Ibrahim for inviting me. And um, really love you, the work that you're doing. Um, the videos, very high quality, I must admit. Really cool, um, discussions as well. I think I've listened to about seven so far. Um, but yeah, please keep up the good work. And yeah, may Allah put Tawfiq and the work that you're doing. But yeah, I really, really enjoy your content. I mean, Jazakallah Khairan, it's been a pleasure speaking to you, inshallah. Speak to you another time, hopefully, with the audience present as well. Yeah.